38, yeah, that's right. So I'll read 13. I'll read 13. And Karen will read 13, and Tanya will get the bonus of only having to read 12. Okay, here we go. Acts chapter 20, verse 1. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sopater and of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus and Secundus, of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby, Timothy, and Tychicus, Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together, and in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But when Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him, said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, had broken bread, and eaten, and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. They were a lot comforted. Verse 13, then, went, then we went ahead to the ship and sailed to Assos, there intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. When he met, when he met us at Assos, he took him aboard and went on to Mytilene. The next day we set sail from there and arrived off Chios. The day after we crossed over to Samos and on the following day arrived at Miletus. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me, if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you, declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I command you to God and to the world, word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance from all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of Lord Jesus that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorry most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. All right, thank you. So we, uh, we looked at the first section, verses 1 through 6. And this is Paul again on his third missionary journey. And uh, he was traveling through Macedonia and Greece. And we covered those uh, verses last week. We won't spend a lot of time on that. Tonight, uh, we looked at verses 7 through 12, Eutychus raised from the dead at Troas, and uh, kind of a, a little bit of a humorous story. 
and then, until he dies, and then it's not that funny, but that he fell asleep during Paul's long message, which we talked about last week, was probably one of the longest sermons on record, six to ten hours of speaking about the things of the Lord, and of these Ephesians were just sponges soaking it up, because all they had known was foreign gods, they never had a God that had actual power to do something in their lives, and Paul only had one night, he was leaving, and probably was never in his life going to come back. Um, and so that's why um, he felt like he must just keep sharing everything that God put up on his heart. And uh, not that that's a precedent for six to ten hour messages, because that's a long time. But can you imagine how tired he was too? Yeah. Well, yeah. He had to be the Holy Spirit. Sure. His strength. I mean, that's just... Yeah. And probably the next day he was just like... <sighs> yeah, because when you minister, it wears you out as well. So um, we, uh, we finished uh, verses uh, 7 through 12, and then we started... Uh, 13 through 37, Paul's farewell to the uh, Ephesian elders, and uh, we got a little bit into that. That actually covers, it's actually through verse 38, because there's 38 verses. Um, I believe we're on the page that starts with, we must seek. Is that where we left off? Was that at the top there? And uh, So let's pick up there, and uh, we'll see how far we get tonight. I think we should probably uh, finish off chapter 20. So uh, there at the top, we must seek God constantly, respecting His will, taking nothing, nothing for granted. God has a perfect way for all concerned, and it is up to the believer, even as we have repeatedly st stated, to ascertain that will and not let go until clear direction is forthcoming, at least as far as is possible. And especially concerning the things that God's created us for, callings that He's placed upon our lives, uh, the involvement in the kingdom of, of heaven that each one of us has, and that's whether we're just involved in the local church or whether we're involved in the Great Commission or however you want to look at it, it doesn't matter. It, it's, all, it's all the same. God's saying we ought to seek His will because when we begin to do our own will and our own agenda, um, a lot of times we can find ourselves actually fighting against God instead of doing what God wants us to do. And so our prayer life ought to be strong because we need God's strategies all the time. God, what's your strategy for even this, you know, Sunday school class that I'm teaching for kids or kids' church or uh, even singing in the choir, using our mixed musical talents for the Lord. We need to pray and say, God, what's your will? Help me to be led by your spirit, empowered by your spirit in the center, in the palm of your hand um, so that I can be most effective for your kingdom. And that's what, that was Paul's hard attitude. And, and Paul probably had some reason for pride, didn't he? Uh, as he's going along, he'd seen God use him in powerful ways. And sometimes we do that. We think we've got God figured out because he does something powerful in our life a couple times. You know, maybe he leads, we lead someone to salvation. Or for Paul, he was planting churches and seeing rank heathens, you know, experience not only salvation, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's easy for our flesh to say, oh, I had something to do with that. And really, um, we have to, like Paul said, we have to die daily, keep laying our lives at the foot of the cross, and crucify that pride and that flesh so that we can seek God's will. If our will gets in the way, um, it's going to cloud and, and confuse the strategies that God has for us. And so that's important um, for us to do that. I realize something else that um, oftentimes in my life, he does not move in the same way twice. Yeah. I might have the exact same circumstance, and I think, oh, okay, this is what God did last time, this is what he's going to do, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that makes us dependent upon him. Right. It makes us lean upon the Lord, and, and so that's important. Yeah. And that's what happened with the children of Israel in the Old Testament. You know, they, they took Jericho one way, but that's not the way. God never did that again. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we should learn from that and learn from the mistakes of that and then know that God will help us. And he'll give us the victory plans every time. I think it's cool because it makes the enemy have to be on his toes, too. If it was the same way, then the enemy would know, too, that this is the way God's going to work. So um, I think that really has a lot to do with it. Not that God just likes to switch things up on us. <laughs> so I think it also switches things up on the enemy. All right, the next paragraph. How many today can say as Paul that they are interested in nothing whatsoever except that which the Lord desires? That's a big statement, and uh, of course we might say that that's where we are, but uh, when we analyze our own life, uh, God searched me, am I really there? Is all that I want what you want? And that's what, where we need to be, and uh, that's a good gut check, that's a good way to keep ourselves balanced. God, am I desiring what you desire, what your word says I ought to be desiring, and if I'm not, God, strip away those desires that are not of you. 
All right, Psalm 16, um, verses 5 and 6. Let's look at that real quick. <clears throat> Psalm 16. It says, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. And if I can turn the page. I've obviously never read Psalm 16 in this Bible. Um, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. All right? So the Lord has been gracious to us. And that's what the psalmist is talking about here. Uh, he's our portion. He's what we need. Um, sometimes we, we see the advertising in the world and we think we need whatever is on the commercial, you know. Um, but God says he's our portion, he's our inheritance. Um, was it Moses in the Old Testament or Abraham, I forget. He says, I am is the one that's sending you. I think it was to Moses. And he says, I am, whatever you need, fill in the blank, I am. If you need provision, I am your provision. If you need peace. I am your peace. And I believe that God is the same today to those who are in covenant relationship with Him. Um, he is whatever we have need of. Um, and the lines really have, especially as Americans, they have fallen to us in pleasant places. We've been given so much, and we're going to be accountable for uh, to whom much is given, much is required. And so we need to thank the Lord for that. And Paul knew that. Paul knew that he could do nothing if the Lord didn't provide, if the Lord wasn't his portion. And uh, sometimes all we may have in our life, especially if we're in full-time ministry, is our salvation and our calling that we're sure of. And that's enough. That's enough. Uh, all the other stuff that we kind of get anxious and worked up about, it's really not going to matter uh, when the trumpet sounds. So we need to hold on to the fact that the Lord is our portion. How many preachers are going to stand before God one day with the blood of many on their hands because they did not faithfully preach the Word of God? And would not deliver what the Lord told them to deliver. To be sure, and sadly so, it will probably probably be the far greater majority. Okay, in our modern churches, I think it grieves the Lord some of the stuff that's on Christian television that's just tickling the ears of, of people and is to get support, you know, to get finances into their ministry. And ministries do need finances to do the work of God, but I think um, I think there's a lot of people who just they don't want to say anything negative. They don't want to preach a negative word. Well, sometimes, as you see in the Apostle Paul, uh, in this chapter, God tells us to give warning and to speak something that may not be popular. And he's looking for men and women who will be fully yielded to the Holy Spirit and, uh, and speak that. And there'll be blessings that are so much greater than the favor and the remuneration of the world uh, when we get to heaven. And so we need to remember that and speak what God tells us to speak. There's souls hanging in the balance. Um, that are so much more important than our own reputation or our own agenda, and we need to speak what God wants us to say. All right, the word must not be compromised, weakened, diluted, or abbreviated. It must always be, thus saith the Lord. And whatever that entails must be faithfully delivered, irrespective of the outcome. Okay, doesn't the devil do that sometimes, even just in our witnessing? Well, what if they reject you? Well, what if they think you're an idiot? Or what if what you tell them that God has even put in your heart that you didn't even know about them before, before you started ministering to them? What if, what if they just look at you like you're crazy? Well, what if they do? Jesus took the ridicule and the shame and the mocking of people as he went down the Via Dolorosa and went to the cross. Um, who are we to think that we won't suffer some shame and our own flesh may have to die in some of those we need to just speak the truth, let God worry about the consequences and the outcome. Not everybody we witness to is going to get saved. Not everybody that we preach to is going to receive the message as, as we kind of imagine or, or want it in our hearts. We think that God wants it to come. Um, but that's not our responsibility to, to force a response or to, to draw a response out of somebody. We're just to deliver, sow the seed, water the seed. Sometimes we'll see the harvest, sometimes we won't. And uh, we need to trust the Lord in that. All right, um, I think it was India. Uh, Mark and Hold of Untain had gone to India after several people for probably a thousand years had gone to India. I forget which one of the apostles went there. Do you remember? One of the 12 apostles went to India, and, and it was, I think, according to legend or by history, he was murdered there, martyred for the, for the faith, and it, that's the way India was. It was so hardened to the gospel, and by the time... Mark and Hold of Untamed started there, and I think in the either late 50s, early 60s, and they started the Calcutta Mercy Mission Hospital and all that. 
um, they were reaping the benefits of many people who had given their lives. Um, and so we have to realize that. We don't know where we are in the process. We just need to be in the process. And if we walk in simple obedience, um, God's going to bring the increase. He's going to bring uh, eternal results out of that. All right? Uh, Paul was able to reproduce himself in this region in such a spectacular way because of the Holy Spirit's work in and through him for four reasons. All right, number one, he was unselfish. And you can see that in verse 24. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus. Notice he didn't say my ministry. He said the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. There's so many in the modern church say, well, I don't do that because that's not my ministry. Well, if you do have a ministry, it's not your ministry anyway. It's God's ministry. And however God wants us to be uh, servants of his, that's where we ought to be serving. Um, and uh, a lot of goofiness in that. But Paul was unselfish. We can see that in Philippians 2.5. He talks about the self-emptying of Christ, how Jesus became nothing. He made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, uh, when he came to earth as a man, and that that's the example we ought to follow. And so we need to be unselfish if we want the Holy Spirit's power to help us to do something spectacular, you know, something that's bigger than us. Number two, Paul was saturated with the gospel. In uh, verse 21 of Acts 20, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Where did he learn it? He learned it in the Word. And uh, that's what we need to give people, not Christian cliches or quotes from great authors. That's, that's good, that's encouraging and sometimes inspiring. But sometimes those men fail as well. And we need to give people the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the word of God. All right, number three, he declared all the counsel of God or the whole will of God. Look at verse 27 again. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I, I venture to say that even churches right here in our own city, um, very few actually preach the whole counsel of God where they cover the balance of Scripture. Many of them are stuck in one particular doctrine or one particular topic that they like to preach about, whether it's grace or faith or whatever. And those are important things, grace and faith. But the whole counsel of God is also important. And if we want disciples who are fully devoted followers of Christ, growing and maturing and going to deeper depths and higher heights, we've got to preach the whole gospel of Jesus Christ, and, uh, and Paul was about um, doing that, and the, the whole will of God, everything that God wants for us, um, not just the convenient things, or the things that sound good, uh, prosperity doctrine, which is pretty common in, in Christian television, but the whole will of God, those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, that's not a fun thing to consider, but we need to have the whole counsel, the whole will of God. All right, number four, he was consumed with sincere concern, which manifested itself in all humility and tears and trials. All right? And that's in uh, verses 19 and 31. Look at verse 31. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Sometimes the things that God asks us to minister or to do in ministry, they may bring tears. They may not be pleasant to our flesh. They may be uncomfortable. They may cause us to have to lay aside our desires for his desires. Um, but the, the tears God notices. There's several scriptures. I think there's one in Psalms that says that God puts our tears in a bottle. And so he sees those things he notices. And when it's uh, for his kingdom's cause, I believe there's going to be a reward. And that's why Paul was so greatly rewarded. And we need to follow uh, his example and Christ's example as well. All right, on the next page. Souls will be genuinely saved. Uh, believers will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Sick bodies will be healed. Bondages will be broken in hearts and lives when this great gospel is preached in its fullness. Okay, why do we see maybe less than what we've been studying about in the book of Acts in the modern church? Maybe because we're not preaching the full gospel. Maybe because we're caught on pet doctrines and things that tickle our ears or that feed our flesh. And we're not preaching the whole gospel, so we're not receiving all the benefits. And it should be no surprise to us. In fact, the Holy Spirit, I maintain, will only anoint that which is all the counsel of God. He will not anoint a partial counsel. Okay, those that want to cut out like the 
certain denominations that don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, we'll just cut that part out. It was for the first century church, but it's not for us. You know, other doctrines that, we, that are, are cut out, we need the full gospel. We need to be walking in obedience to everything that God has um, put in our, in our scriptures so that we can have the anointing. The anointing breaks the yoke of oppression off the enemy. And so we need to walk in all the truth, all the counsel of God. All right, the flock cannot rise any higher than the man who stands behind the pulpit or the woman. If the love of God fills his heart, his people will have that same spirit. If there is a burden for souls on his part, a hunger for the moving of the Holy Spirit, some of his people will most certainly follow course. Okay, they're not going to rise any higher than their leader, especially if they got saved under that person, you know, that person's ministry. And that's why it's so important that we recognize people are watching us. They're following our life, whether we like that or not. And so we need to live our lives as a, as a perfect example, uh, following Jesus as the perfect example. All right, the word grievous in the Greek text is baros. It means oppressive or burdensome. In other words, the agenda is personal greed in one way or the other, making great demands on the people. Okay, and Paul is making reference, I believe, in this chapter to the Judaizers who are saying they had to be saved by Jesus, but then they also had to have these works of the Old Testament law, circumcision and, and other stuff. And really what they wanted was control over the people, just like the Pharisees and Sadducees in Jesus' day. That's why they were so threatened by Jesus, because they lost control, because they had really no power. They thought they had power, but it was all self-mustered up power. Uh, that they had created by putting people under their thumbs and appointing themselves into places of leadership. And it's the same thing in the modern church world today. A lot of denominations, we've got people who are elected to offices by preachers and to fulfill uh, leadership roles. And some of them are great men and women of God and know that they've been put in a very serious position. And they cry out to God for, for wisdom and grace to, to, to lead in that position. But there's a lot who don't. And they're in a position, and they're lording that position over others. And, um, and they, they are, the things that they're putting on other people are oppressive and burdensome, and a lot of times just for their own profit. And, um, and God's going to see that. I believe God sees it, and He's going to judge it. Um, and we, we've just got to give those things to the Lord, and make sure that we're um, not in that kind of situation ourselves in ministry. All right? Jesus, again, remember, was the... the perfect example of how we should lead and he took his sandals off his feet took the sandals off all his disciples feet and took a towel and began to wash his 12 apostles feet which was the lowest slave's responsibility because when you walk around in sandals all day with no socks and just you know bare feet and sandals on dirt roads you have some pretty filthy feet by the end of the day and Jesus took the sandals off at the end of the day washed all of his disciples feet not that foot washing was supposed to be a doctrine as it's become. Foot washing is okay, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's not really a doctrine. It's only recorded once in the Bible. A doctrine should be more than once. Uh, but it was a, a, an example of servanthood, of real leadership. And, uh, and that's what we need to really get a hold of, and that's what he's teaching here. All right, Satan will attempt to raise up individuals within the local church who will have their own agenda and not the mind of God. It shouldn't be a surprise to us. Why would Satan do that? Why would Satan raise up somebody within the local church or within the body, of so-called body of Christ? Yeah. Yeah, he's afraid of unity. And he's going to use the people closest to us, right? Sometimes it's family, you know, real blood relatives. And sometimes it's our church family, you know. And it, it, it can set us back if we're not really looking to Jesus in those situations. And, um, and so what do we do if somebody comes in that situation and have their own agenda, not the money of God? How do we deal with that? Yeah. Vengeance is mine. God says, I will repay. And uh, sometimes we have to break fellowship with people. And Paul teaches that in 1 Corinthians 5. The man that wouldn't repent, and he was in blatant sin. And, um, you know, but yet was speaking all kinds of justification for what he was doing. There was no justification for what he was doing. And sometimes it's not quite as bad as 1 Corinthians 5. It may just be someone who's divisive and likes to stir up stink, you know, in the church. Um, and we just have to let God deal with those. Sometimes we have to for a while until God can deal with their hearts. Like the instance in 1 Corinthians 5, 
But we've got to fight the right battles. There's too many churches that are fighting against, the, the members are fighting against each other. And what's suffering is the Great Commission. What's suffering are the broken and the lost in our cities um, that desperately need Jesus. And we're busy fighting over the air conditioning. We're fighting over, you know, the order of service. We're fighting over any number of things that really aren't going to matter uh, when the trumpet sounds. And so we need to say, God, give us your agenda. Give me your agenda. And God, if I'm caught up in the wrong battle, help me to break fellowship if I need to. Help me to give those things to you and let God deal with those things. And sometimes that's easier said than done. Um, especially when Satan uses someone close to us. Uh, but Paul led in that example as well. Uh, he was on three missionary journeys. He didn't have time for the drama, right? He didn't have time for things that really weren't going to matter in eternity. And we should be the same today. We're, we're so close to Christ's return. Uh, we need to have our minds focused. All right? The Lord would have you to attend a church where you can truly get your soul fed by the Word of God. Why do most people leave a church? What's the reason they give to the pastor? I'm not being fed. <laughs> so we're supposed to be fed when we come to church, but um, I think we have... Yeah, go ahead. Right. Well, the problem is, is not most of the time not that we're not getting fed, it's that we're not exercising. Well, I, I think it's the fact that that's the only meal we're getting Sunday yeah. morning. They're not taking time for devotions throughout the week. And if you take time every day on your own, that's just going to be a supplement. Right. Right. And that's exactly it. And then we're not exercising our gifts. Right. And so you eat and eat. If you go to Golden Corral, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, five days in a row, that's how people's church life is. They're feeding themselves on, and sometimes it's a great preacher, a great ministry that they're receiving spiritual food from, but they're not exercising the gifts that God's put upon their life, and so they're more spiritually fat. And uh, we've received so much that we haven't even applied. We could spend two or three years just applying it before we even needed another meal. And, uh, and that's really what's going on in a lot of times when people say they're not being fed. There are times when that's the truth, though. Even though that's a common excuse and that may not be the real excuse, there are times when you do need to leave a church if you're not being spiritually fed. But I think it's probably more rare than, than what we actually but see. Even if you're not being fed, it doesn't mean you need to leave the church. You still need to ask God because God might still be yeah. there. Sometimes it may be your own eating disorder. <laughs> You're not eating right. Like you said, not spending personal time. Sometimes he may just want you there for somebody else. Yeah. You're fine and you're not getting fed, but he just wants you there for some other reason. Yeah, yeah. So that's just like you said, it's only a small part of why we go to church. We go to church also to bless others. And, uh, and that's, what, that's what we need to keep in balance. Um, so as well, there will be a moving and operation of the Holy Spirit in the church that God wants us to be at. There's a moving and operation of the Holy Spirit present in the services. That's a healthy environment for not only for us to be fed, but for us to serve others. Because we know, because the Holy Spirit's there prompting us, this person needs prayer. This person needs a practical need met in their life. And if there's no freedom for the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit, um, it can become an unhealthy situation and uh, cause us to suffer. So the criteria always is the Word and the Spirit of God. Everything else is spurious. Right? And there's a lot of churches that it's all about programs. Um, and we're competing with other churches in our cities for who has the most and, and greatest programs. And it's not just programs. Uh, if those programs don't have the Word of God and they don't have the operation and the moving of the Holy Spirit, they're just wheels in motion in God's eyes. And we need to make sure that we have that um, in, in the local church. All right? It is only the preacher who truly loves the people who at the same time will warn them Okay, do you believe that? Our parents did that, didn't they, as we were growing up? Hopefully. There are, you know, if they're doing what they're supposed to, yeah. you know, that's what parents are supposed to do, is not only, um, you know, give hugs and kisses and rewards for the good things that happen when we're kids, but when you stick your hand on the stove, the burner of the stove that's bright red, you know, popping your hand so that you know that's not right. If we don't warn people uh, in our spiritual lives, uh, we're setting them up for failure. We're setting them up for bad things as, as Christian leaders. And so we need to be, uh, be willing to do that. Uh, we need to warn them, even though at times he knows it is not what they want to hear. It is the hireling who seeks to tell people only what they want to hear and not what they need to hear. What are a lot of pastors worried about if they preach something that's a warning or a, a rebuke or a correction? Or stop paying their tithes. And are we called to 
preach because to, to, to appease the tithe payers, or are we called to deliver what God but wants us to say? Christians who actually pay their tithes is so small. I don't know right. You're <laughs> right. Right, but there's a, you'd be amazed how many times God spoke something that he wanted a pastor to say and he was afraid to say it or would not say it or an evangelist because they're afraid of how their pocketbook might be affected. And we need to be careful that we're not hirelings. God is our source. He's our provider. We need to speak what he says um, because that's what's going to change people. And that's what may cause the person who's not a tithe bearer to become a tithe bearer when they hear the warning of God and they come to repentance and uh, give their hearts to Jesus. And so that's important. All right, this last paragraph at the bottom. At the moment of conversion, all believers become heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And Romans chapter 8 tells us that. And it's all because of Jesus that we're heirs. Jesus, God adopts us into the family just as if we're a son like Jesus. And the only way we can be a son like Jesus is to be in Jesus Christ and stay there. Once we get outside of Christ in our flesh or living in sin, acts of sin again, uh, we're, we're endangering our inheritance. We're endangering uh, the blessing that this, these verses talk about in Romans chapter 8. In fact, the Holy Spirit with the outward evidence of speaking with other tongues is the earnest or first installment of our inheritance. All right, Ephesians, look at, look at Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. That's a good verse. Some good verses. Ephesians 1. 13 and 14, it says, in, whom, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. All right, so what that experience was like, if you've ever received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, how that felt the emotion around that, the sweet presence of God that you feel. Jesus said it's like rivers of living water flowing out from the inside of you. He says that's just a taste. That's just a small down payment of what it's going to be like to be in the Shekinah glory of God, the manifest presence of God, the physical presence of God that we'll experience when we get to heaven. And so that should be something we're looking forward to. Amen? And uh, that's what we need. All right, on the last page here, Paul was satisfied with whatever he had, wherever he was, as long as he could do God's work. Are we there? I am some days. <laughs> but sometimes that's a battle, you know, to, to have faith in God, to be satisfied with whatever we have, wherever we are. Sometimes, you know, I think, well, God, I thought I was going to be here, you know, or I thought, uh, you know, you had this in store in this particular way. And God says, well, I still have it in store for you, but it's just not like how you thought. And you're in the place that you are to get you ready for the place that I'm, you know, I showed you I was going to bring you. So uh, that's what Paul went through as well in ministry. And we can learn a lot from his example. Examine your attitudes toward wealth and comfort. As Americans, that's a huge thing. We think that God's will, we think that God's blessings indicate God's favor over our life. And that's not always true. But we take that scripture that he's going to bless us more abundantly to mean just finances. Right. It's not just that. It's spiritually and everything else. Right. And sometimes it's a blessing that he doesn't give us what we want. Yeah. And we don't, the, the prosperity movement would say, no, you just don't have enough faith. But sometimes he doesn't give us what he wants, what we want, because he sees down the road how we're going to make a huge mess out of it. And that's a blessing, that he doesn't give us what we want. So just because we have wealth and comfort and convenience and ease in our life and the and way we're living our everyday life, that doesn't indicate necessarily the blessings of God. The Old Testament, the children of Israel, God blessed them anyway. Um, he blessed them even though they were walking in rebellion many times. But they didn't repent. They still didn't uh, give their heart to God. So uh, we need to be careful with that. We have a warped um, eye view of that, I think, sometimes in our culture. I know. I experienced since I haven't had a full-time job in five years. I've had... Christians question whether or not it was actually God's will for me to move out here. It's like, just because it didn't work out the way I had anticipated does not mean it's not His will. Right. But, well, and the lessons just for, for what God's bringing you into admissions, oh, yeah. how in the world could you trust God for your provision right. in China or in Asia, yeah. in the places that you're going, without, right. without you know, having taken those baby steps to begin with? Yeah. And that's, that's a huge thing, and that's what we've got to remember is, is God's uh, God's developing us a little bit at a time. 
So if you focus more on what you don't have than on what you do have, it's time to re-examine your priorities and to put God's work back into first place. All right, it's all about His agenda, His kingdom's cause, not our own kingdom. And uh, we need to remember that. All right, so the established pattern was to be that pastors, that the pastors would be cared for by the flock. All right, at least when the church became established in order that the pastor may be able to give all of his time to the spiritual care of the people. All right, so Paul plants this church in Ephesus and that's where he's trying to bring them to. They need to sustain a pastor and have a spiritual leader raised up. Paul's not going to be their pastor forever. And that's what he's trying to tell these Ephesian elders as he's getting ready to leave. Is you need to have leadership that is raised up and that is supported by you and that can devote full time to the ministry. And that's something that's foreign to them because, again, all they knew was heathen practices. And Paul really blessed the people on his missionary journeys because he did tent making on the side to where he didn't make them obligated to pay him for the ministry and the work that he was doing. And he did some incredible work in establishing churches in these, in these communities, in these cities all over the world, all over the then known world. Um, and, but there's an example there that we need to follow. All right, the very economy of God, the way he operates his business, is based on the principle of giving. All right, John also wrote, For God so loved the world that he gave. Right? That's God's economy. It's on giving. What we think is, well, God, if you give me all this, if you give me what's behind door number one, then I'll give X amount of dollars to missions. But God says, no, you give me the X amount of dollars to missions and trust me in that and see if I won't open up not only door number one, but door number two and number three. That's how God's economy works. But we don't like that. That's not pleasing to our flesh because we like to line up our ducks in a row and have control of it. God says, relinquish control. I'm your source. Trust me first and then I will bless you. And that's really what Malachi 3 says. Trust me with your tithes and your offerings. Not just, it really doesn't just say tithes, which a lot of pastors preach, a lot of people preach. It actually says, trust me in the tithe that already belongs to me, and over and above that, offerings. And then, when you give the over and above, that's a real giver. I will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that's so large you cannot contain it. If we don't understand God's economy, we can't receive the blessings the way God wants us to. And like you said, very few Christians are tithing. And so, but then they're, they're walking in lack and they're wanting people to pray for them. And I respect the pastor or the minister who will say, well, are you paying your tithes first? Because you're, you're praying in circles if you're not, because God can't bless disobedience. And so if we'll just walk in obedience, God can bless us and, and meet those needs. That's his economy. That's how it works. Uh, as such, and having the Lord as our supreme example, the believer must follow suit regarding this all-important principle. All right, God gave us the best thing that heaven had to offer. He gave us Jesus. And we, there was no guarantee, there's still no guarantee today that every, every sinner is going to get saved, but God still gave. And there's no guarantees when we give that we're going to understand how the money is going to come in. But if we just walk in obedience, God says he'll meet the need. All right. By contrast, the economy of God is diametrically opposed to its opposite. I'm talking about the economy of the world, which is one of greed and covetousness. What is covetousness? Yeah, keeping up with the Joneses, isn't it? The neighbors next door get a nice boat or some nice wave runners, and we're like, man, we need some nice wave runners, even if we can't afford it, even if we're putting it on a credit card to buy it. Covetousness is a huge part of, of uh, unfortunately, the American so-called dream, and it's really becoming a nightmare, and people are living way above their means uh, because of covetousness. God says, if you'll give, I'll provide, and uh, we need to live in God's economy. All right, the last paragraph there, the gift of salvation is the greatest gift of all, and certainly is given by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. However, that gift must be brought to dying humanity and can only be done so in some way by preachers of the gospel. Okay, and preachers of the gospel are not just supposed to be those that have gone to Bible school, those who are called to full-time ministry. That word really in the New Testament, more often than not, is talking about just a believer being a heralder of the good news, like the boy who stood on the corner with the newspaper said, extra, extra, read all about it. We've got the best story. We've got the best front page 
news that people need to hear today, even in 2013, even though it's the same story that's been told for 2,000 years, it's still the best story. It's still the good news that people need to hear. And if we're not supporting and encouraging and helping uh, preachers of the gospel proclaim the good news, if we're not involved in that ourselves, uh, we can't expect what they've seen in the book of Acts, the miracles, the signs, and the wonders that follow the preaching of the word. And uh, so we need to pray, God, help me to be a part of that. Help me to proclaim, not only with my words, but with my actions and my lifestyle, um, that Jesus, you're the answer. You're the hope uh, for lost sinners. And then that's when we can see some of the things that we've seen in Acts uh, happen in our day. All right? Any questions, comments, concerns about chapter 20? All right, well, let's close in prayer. Um, pray for my mom and dad. They have a contract on their house in uh, Tulsa and uh, had an inspection and just some little nitpicky details that have to be taken care of. My dad is actually working full-time here, and um, they were on their anniversary trip, and he, they came back, and he's supposed to be back here working, and then they have all this stuff, little things, you know, that came up with the house that he's got to stay there and fix, and get stuff and it's just frustrating it's not big things but it's just a bunch of little things so pray that god will just uh make this whole transition a blessing and not a burden were the tornadoes anywhere close they actually had one in broken arrow which is like five miles from my parents house and from where my, my sister still lives there and um it was in they live right on the line of tulsa broken arrow um, but they were safe it didn't it didn't do any damage i think it was an f2 ef2 um, they tore up a couple of houses, but nothing like yeah. El Reno and, and more. Right. Uh, but it's still scary. They, they've had the sirens going off all spring, like several nights, and that's nerve-wracking. When you got to go to work the next day and the sirens have been going off. And my sister does not, and my mom and dad don't either. They don't have a basement or a storm cellar. So, you know, you're just looking for the most secure room in your house. And when you look at what happened in Moore and El Reno, I mean, even a storm cellar is, is hardly adequate. So it's, it's pretty scary. So yeah, just pray that they can get that sold and get all those details taken care of. And uh, it's just kind of stressful being in limbo, you know, between two states. So pray for that. Um, continue to pray for Becky Hammett's dad. Um, needs a miracle. Not really much change there. Um, suffering with cancer. I mean, no more bad news, which that's kind of good news, but it's still um, having trouble eating and very weak. Um, not much hope from the doctors. So as far as that goes, nothing much has changed. So let's continue to pray for a miracle there. Any other needs that you guys have? Um, I spoke to my dad recently, and my niece, which is my brother's daughter in sister of the uh, brother who was drowned. Um, so she was taken out of the home and she's been living with her aunt all this time, which has been a blessing. It really has been. But my dad said that apparently the court has said that she will be going home back to her mom and her stepdad, which I'm praying earnestly against it. Yeah. Because I've spoken to her mom and she's still, you know, struggling with drinking and doesn't have a job, and it's just not a good situation at all. Yeah. Wow. So. Well, sometimes those courts just they give too much leaning, or what's the word I'm looking for? Too much uh, to the parents. I mean, they. She has a history of neglect. Yeah. I mean, all throughout their lives, there's been nothing but neglect. The court knows that. Yeah, and she's crazy. and my niece is like thirteen. And she's What's her name again? Emily. Emily. And she's just at that age that's like, oh my gosh, you know, she could just go down the wrong road quickly. Yeah. Well, let's pray for her, for sure. Anything else? All right. Well, let's pray, and then we'll dismiss. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, tonight for your word, and uh, for how it refreshes us. It gives us clear perspective on our lives. Uh, Lord, I pray that your word would, would lead us and guide us this week in the things that we do and the decisions that we make. Uh, we want to be in the center of your will and your plan.